Hey everybody, before I begin this video proper, I wanted to give a warning to those of you who might have issues with photosensitivity. If flashing or flickering lights cause any kind of problems for you, then I would recommend against watching this video, and especially against playing Tech War. Because it's bad enough that there's a lot of flickering lights in the environments you're walking around in, and it's bad enough that the screen flashes yellow every time you pick up an item, and red whenever you take damage, which is a lot throughout the game. But it's somehow even worse when you get to the matrix section of the game and in fact when I talk about that section I'm gonna go ahead and throw in a photosensitivity warning on top of this one I'm giving at the beginning of the video just because that section is so bad about the flickering and flashing and lights that I don't even have photosensitivity problems and it was still giving me a massive headache to try to play through it so yeah it needs its own separate warning there but anyway now that I have provided ample warning for those of you with photosensitivity problems to click away from the video let's go ahead and get this video going Hello and welcome to the second review of Request Month 2024. This is William Shatner's Tech War, originally released exclusively for DOS, and while I did originally play the DOS version, what you'll be seeing throughout this video is the Build GDX source port. This is a first-person shooter by Capstone Software that was released in 1995 exclusively for DOS, making it the second officially licensed commercial release on the Build engine, and a game that preceded the release of Duke Nukem 3D by several months. And in case you're wondering what the first officially licensed commercial release on the Build engine was, it's Witch Haven, which, funnily enough, is also by Capstone Software and released a month prior to Tech War. Which definitely explains a fair bit, but we'll get there when we get there, don't worry. Anyway, the other major oddity with this game is the fact that it is a tie-in game, and I'm not entirely sure what it's supposed to be tied in with. You see, most of you are not going to be familiar with any of the material that Tech War is based on. It started out with a series of novels that started publication in 1989 and went all the way up through 1997. There are nine of those novels in total. And from those novels spawned an entire media franchise, including of course the novels themselves, but also a comic book series called Tech World, which in turn spawned its own selection of trading cards, which is just baffling to think about. And once you move past the print media, you get to the live action television series that aired from 94 to 96, and that also spawned a couple of TV movies. And then in 2009, there was an additional comic book adaptation called The Tech War Chronicles. And the most recent development is that in 2021, an animated series was announced, although it doesn't seem like there's been any news on that since then. So where does the PC game fit into all this? Well, when you look at information available on the game, it's usually cited as being based on the novels, but that's really only technically true because you can tell quite easily if you've seen any of the TV series that it's definitely far more based on the TV series than it is the books. Although when I say it's more based on the TV series than the books, that's not really saying much. It's a very loose adaptation of the entire source material, and the main elements that it takes from the TV show are just visual things, most notably with regards to a few of the weapon designs. And as for how much all of that has to do with the books, well, not a huge amount there either. The TV series also is a pretty loose adaptation of the books, and I know this because I read a bunch of the books. I found most of the series at my local bargain bin for about two bucks a piece. So I figured, what the hell, why not give it a try? And turns out, the books actually aren't too bad. They're not great, don't get me wrong. But if you're in the mood for some pulpy sci-fi detective stuff, well, you could definitely do a lot worse, let's put it that way. But of course, the question here is, having seen a few bits and pieces of the TV show and thus understanding where at least some of the visual elements for the game come from, and having read at least some of the books so I have an idea of what the source material is, did any of that help out with the experience of playing through the Tech War PC game? <laughs> no, not really. It did help me understand what tech is, at least, so when we get to the talk about the story, I'll at least be able to tell you what that is. But it's not like story is going to matter all that much in a 1995 first-person shooter. So you know what? Let's just go ahead and start delving right into this thing and see what exactly we're dealing with here. And like always, we'll go ahead and start with the presentation, which, like I said, runs on the build engine, which means we're dealing with a lot of 2D sprite work. And the sprites in this are actors that are digitized very, very poorly. Everything is severely pixelated to the point where sometimes you can barely tell what they're actually going for with the sprite work, and it really doesn't help that the scaling is all kinds of borked. 
Now a lot of that is certainly due to the game's camera being set at basically the crotch level, meaning that everything seems way bigger than it actually is. But even if you take that into consideration, the scaling is still off. And then of course there's the matter of the animations in this game basically being one or two frames long, so everything looks choppy even if the game is running fine. But once you move past the character and weapon sprites, you're into the environments, and that's where things get really messy. A lot of times you'll look at the environments and not really be sure exactly what you're looking at. A lot of the environments look very samey, and in fact, some are so samey that it makes them actually very difficult to navigate. And while Capstone made significant efforts to try to make the environments look like they could be real, lived-in spaces, albeit in the grim, dark future of 2044, they still made a lot of very poor decisions with regards to which textures they decided to use for things like doors, making some of the environments quite confusing to navigate as you're wondering what's actually a door versus what's just set dressing, and the same is true for elevators. Some of them are very clearly designed to be elevators, and then others are just platforms that raise and lower, and more often than not, they just look like regular walls. The end result of all of this is really weird, because you can tell there are times where Capstone really put in a lot of effort to try to make an environment look kind of believable, but there's always something that is so janky about the whole affair that it looks utterly ridiculous instead. Whether it be simply the scaling on the various sprites, or the fact that the vehicles in this game are all just flat polygons that have a flat texture on them and they just glide around the map in preset patterns, or the fact that nearly all of the environments have static lighting but you'll go into certain spots and it will actually have some relatively dynamic lighting in a very, very localized area, or they even just get the scaling in the area itself horribly wrong. Or the level ends up being too much like an old-school first-person shooter and just becomes completely labyrinthine to the point where it becomes completely non-believable. But while all of that is definitely very rough and makes this game look pretty ugly, it all absolutely pales in comparison to what they did in the Matrix section. Which takes the visuals from ugly but clearly ambitious in some ways to something that is such an egregious assault on your senses that it makes you wonder if the developers were actively trying to harm the player. Now, I'm not going to show you any clips of that just yet because that would require me to throw up a second photosensitivity warning right here and now and then throw up another one when I talk about the gameplay section. So I'll just talk about all of that during the gameplay section and have the photosensitivity warning there. But for now, just understand that the Matrix section has you floating around a black void with a whole lot of very bright flashing and flickering lights. It has you fighting what can best be described as abstract shapes. It has a lot of environments that look exactly the same and make it incredibly easy to get constantly turned around and lost in. And in general, it can be described as one of the worst things ever put into a video game. And that's just from the presentation aspect of it. Just wait until we get to the gameplay section. But The Matrix isn't just bad from a visual standpoint, it's also terrible from a sound standpoint, so that leads me over into the sound design here. And while I'm on the subject of The Matrix, I'll go ahead and get that out of the way. And I would describe it as a maddening cacophony of borderline incomprehensible noise. Constantly bleeping, blooping, and electronically screeching at you to the point where it's best to just turn off your audio entirely because even the audio will give you a headache. But while the Matrix part of the sound is some of the worst stuff ever put into a video game, the rest of the sound design, the stuff that you experience outside of the Matrix, is also really bad. Gun and explosion sounds are just awful, a lot of the guns just have this kind of bleepy bloopy quality to them as well because they're going for more of a sci-fi gun style, and thus you don't get regular gun sounds. Which unfortunately means that none of the guns sound good to use, and more importantly, the sound they chose for the basic pistol that you have throughout the entire game, and which will undoubtedly be your primary weapon throughout the entire game, is... well, just listen to it. <laughs> I'm sure you can tell that that doesn't get annoying or anything. Anyway, point is that the sound effects are pretty crap overall, and then when you move over into other aspects of the sound design, it doesn't really get much better. The only real notable exception there is that the voice acting is remarkably decent, all things considered. The 90s in particular were infamous for having absolutely terrible voice acting in most games that attempted it, but weirdly enough, in Tech War, it's fine. It's not good, don't get me wrong, it's definitely cheesy. But I mean, think about it this way. 
The original Resident Evil released the following year, and it has just wonderfully awful voice acting. Voice acting that is so bad, it's actually kind of hilarious. Meanwhile, Tech War has some admittedly cheesy lines like, Bascom's scraping the bottom of the barrel these days. But the actual delivery of the lines is remarkably competent, and that is just utterly baffling for a capstone software game. But just when you might think things are looking up for the sound design, there's the music to consider, and... Well, it ranges from actually not bad in the case of one or two of the tracks, most notably the Park track, which is surprisingly good, but the rest of the soundtrack is just fairly obnoxious MIDI noise that ends up being annoying more than anything else. And so when you bring all the sound design together, you end up with something that's also kind of a mess. But then there's the elephant in the room that I haven't talked about yet, and you might be wondering why I didn't. This game has a few FMV sequences in it that consist of the opening credit sequence and intro, as well as mission briefings and debriefings. Now, as you might expect from the era, these video files are all severely compressed, and in the case of the opening credit sequence, where it basically just takes clips from the TV show and arranges them in a sort of credit sequence, it is so heavily compressed and pixelated that you can't even tell what's going on most of the time. From there, it goes into a CGI cutscene, which is... Well, it's very 90s CGI, so it looks pretty terrible, but it's terrible in an amusing way, at least. And then after that, you have the briefings and debriefings, which consist entirely of William Shatner standing in one place and talking to you. In other words, the reason I've been waiting until this point to talk about them is because, well, there's just not a whole lot to talk about there. The only thing they really bring to the table is... Well, it's the simple fact that William Shatner's in them, and he's reprising the character that he played in the TV show. I mean, they're not even like a lot of FMV games back in the day, where they were just so badly done that they were kind of hilarious. Here you just get the impression that they included FMV sequences just to have William Shatner's actual likeness there, and, well, not much else. And when you bring the entire presentation together, you end up with something that is an absolute mess. But as bad as the presentation is, what really matter are the story and the gameplay. Only this is a 90s first-person shooter, so it doesn't really have much of a storyline. The game actually doesn't specify who the player character is, but if you've read the books or seen the TV show, or both of course, then you can infer that it's Jake Cardigan, the main character of both the books and the TV show, because the setup of the game is more or less what the setup of the books and the TV show is. In the grim, dark cyberpunk future, prison is actually cryosleep, not an actual prison, and placed into the employ of Walter Bascom, head of a private security and detective agency that is working to take down the tech lords. Now, a couple reasonable questions to ask here would be, what is tech and who are the tech lords? Well, tech is a combination of a headset as well as electronic chips that you slot into the headset, and when you put the headset on, it acts as an extremely potent neural stimulant and hallucinogen. The idea there being that this headset stimulates your brain to give you visions of a fantasy that is so utterly real to you that you basically get completely lost in it. It is extremely addictive and dangerous, and the criminal bosses that oversee its production and distribution are referred to as tech lords. And while that explanation is very simple and straightforward and should be pretty easy for you to understand, it is also considerably more of an explanation than the game itself actually gives you. Now, how does this relate to what you're doing in Tech War the game? Well, the idea is that you're brought out of cryosleep because Bascom says you're the best, and he needs your help to take down these tech lords before they can find a way to broadcast tech across the Matrix, which is the tech war equivalent of cyberspace, and of course, because it's the future, and you see this kind of thing in so much cyberpunk media, you can venture around in the Matrix in a sort of virtual reality, and obviously, if you could broadcast tech across the entire Matrix to pretty much anybody that you wanted, the results could be absolutely catastrophic. So ultimately, the story in Tech War is actually quite simple. 
hunt down the tech lords and stop them from deploying tech into the Matrix directly. The story doesn't get any more complicated than that. When you go into a mission to find a tech lord, you're given a very short briefing telling you who you're going after and where they were spotted and or are known to be hanging out, and then you just go in, you wander around the levels, you do what you need to do in them, and then once you've completed your mission and taken down the tech lord, then the mission abruptly ends and you get your debriefing, where you will get one of two responses depending on your performance in the mission. Either you will be praised pretty much endlessly, or if any civilians were killed during the mission, whether you were directly responsible for it or not, Bascom will chew you out for it and be like, look, you took down the tank lord, but you really need to be more careful. We're not the bad guys, they are. But other than the debriefing cutscene, your performance during the mission doesn't change the actual outcome of the game, and you can complete it regardless. Now there are seven tech lords to take down, and you can actually tackle them in any order that you wish. You don't have to go from Marty Dollar to the next guy, to the next guy, to the next guy, and so on and so forth. That's how I ended up doing it, because it was the most simple and straightforward way to achieve the whole thing. But you can actually go and complete those missions in any order that you want. If you want to start with Janus, you can start with Janus. If you want to start with Marty Dollar, you can start with Marty Dollar. And you can start with any of the other tech lords. It's all up to you. The only real condition for completing the game is that you need to take down all seven tech lords before you're able to complete everything you need to do in the Matrix. And once you've taken down all the tech lords and done everything you need to do in the Matrix, then you've got one last mission where you're just running around doing the same stuff you were doing when taking down the tech lords, and then the game's over. And since there is basically nothing with regards to storyline throughout this thing, it really all falls to the gameplay. So what exactly are we dealing with there? Well, the first thing you need to understand is that the manual outright lies to you. For example, it tells you that the Maytek interface, which is the interface you see up in the top right of the screen, tells you the amount of time you have left before the Matrix forcibly ejects you, when in reality it shows your score and the amount of time you have been playing. It tells you that the interface at the bottom left of your screen denotes how much health, consciousness, and ammo you have, and that if your consciousness drops to zero, then you fall unconscious, except in the game it does absolutely nothing whatsoever, and I have no idea what actually affects it. Because the manual tells you that your health and consciousness goes down when you take damage, but it doesn't seem to be the case in-game, and while I have seen the meter go down a couple of pips, I don't know what actually caused it. And it doesn't seem to have any actual effect in the game anyway, so the C meter is completely superfluous. The manual also tells you that three of the weapons, the Shrike DBK, the Orlo 34S, and the EMP pistol, all require recharge at a power outlet, which doesn't exist in the game at all. They instead have ammo pickups in the case of the Shrike DBK and the Orlo 34S, and the EMP pistol has infinite ammunition. And the manual also tells you that there are two weapons that don't actually show up in the game either, the Force Charge and the Stun Grenade, both of which would have been effectively grenade weapons. It also tells you that in order to enter the Matrix, you need to get a symbol key from one of the Tech Lords after you take them down, and then once you have that, you can go activate a Matrix station in order to hop into a small section of the Matrix instead of what's actually in the game, which is there aren't any Matrix stations in any of the levels, it's actually just a section of the level select screen, and once you have all of the Tech Lord's symbol keys from taking them down, then you can go into the Matrix level and do everything you need to do all in one go. It's pretty obvious that the manual was written at a much earlier point in the game's development, and they just didn't bother to correct it before it actually launched. And since the manual's really not any help to you at all, you're just gonna have to figure everything out by the seat of your pants when you're actually playing it. And thankfully, the actual experience of playing Tech War is remarkably simple. When you select a Tech Lord to go after, you get your briefing and then it drops you off in the subway station. You will always start a Tech Lord hunt in the subway station and you can then hop on the subway in order to go to one of up to three stops at any given Tech Lord hunt. And from there, you will basically scour the environment for two different key cards. You'll get red and blue key cards, and once you have those, then you will be able to find wherever the Tech Lord is hiding and take them down. 
once you have taken down that tech lord, the mission automatically ends, you get your debriefing, and you get a symbol that pops up on the bottom of the screen, noting that you have obtained their symbol key. Once you get through the debriefing cutscene, then it puts you back at the level select screen, it grays out the one that you just completed, and then you are free to select any of the others. That all sounds simple and straightforward enough, and once you know that you'll have to repeat this process another six times, you have an idea of how most of the game is going to go. The problem is that the game was developed by Capstone Software, and they really had no idea what they were doing when it comes to level design. So sure, in the most technical of senses, the game functions with a sort of hub system where when you go to hunt down a specific tech lord, it drops you into the subway and that serves as your level hub, and then you can go to those three different stops, each of which will open up into its own level once you get through the security checkpoint. Once you're in that level, then it's a fairly sprawling level that you will have to wander around and explore and find those key cards in. But once you have the key cards, then they are good throughout all the other stops in that subway set. Now you might think they would set this up in such a way to where you would go to one stop, you would get one key card, then you would go to the next stop, you would use that key card to get access to things that you couldn't normally access without it, and then you would get a second key card, and then you would go to the third stop, and then you would use the two key cards that you've collected previously to get to where you need to go and take down the tech lord. That's not how they've designed it. In every single one of the stops, you can find a red and a blue key card. It's just a matter of going to the stop that has the Tech Lord at it, getting those key cards, and then just taking down the Tech Lord. So if you know which of the stops the Tech Lord is at, you can just go directly to that stop, go through that level alone, and ignore the other two stops, which are their own self-contained levels. Now obviously, your first time through the game, you're not necessarily going to know that, so you'll probably try to explore all the levels, and when you do that, you find that Capstone's level design incompetence is on full display in every single one. Whether it be really odd scaling on buildings or certain areas, or the layouts of those levels just being such a chaotic mess that you can't figure out where you need to go and what you need to do, and more importantly, you're just going to end up getting lost in them half the time. Or you find things that they clearly thought were cool because they were new features of the build engine that allowed them to do different things than they had done on their previous games, like say Corridor 7 or Operation Body Count which were basically Wolfenstein clones. And so you'll find things like the capstone trucks and the buses that just go around in circles on an endless loop and do not stop for anything, and if you happen to be in front of them, then they will just squish you. And the same is true for NPCs if they wander in front of them, which they will because the AI in this game is just astoundingly terrible, then it will just squish them into giblets. And of course, if it happens to be a civilian, which more often than not it's probably going to be, then that counts as a civilian death and Bascom ends up chewing you out over it in the debrief, regardless of whether you had any control over that or not. To make matters more annoying, when you hop off the subway on one of the stops and you go into the level, you'll find a bunch of weapons scattered around there, you'll pick those up, you might have a good time using them, but you can't carry them into the other subway stops because whenever you go through the subway security gate, it takes all of those weapons away from you and just resets you back to the stun pistol and the basic pistol. So it's basically the equivalent of playing Doom, only every single level you do a pistol start instead of carrying over your weapons from one level to the next. But the especially weird part about it is that the key cards carry over, so you can just go into a different subway stomp, and while you basically pistol start it, you still have the key cards, so you don't need to find them when you're wandering around there. It is just an utterly baffling decision, and when you combine that with the absolutely atrocious level design where you're just wandering around constantly going, where am I going and what am I doing, it makes the process of trying to explore the levels and find what you need to find quite frustrating. Now you might think that combat would throw a monkey wrench into this whole thing and make it even more frustrating, but weirdly enough, it doesn't. Because you find almost immediately that the combat in this game is basically a joke. You see, enemies start shooting at you as soon as you enter their line of sight, and if you start shooting back, you'll notice that their sprite goes into a pain state, but regardless of whether they're in that pain state or not, they just keep shooting at you at the same rate until they finally drop. So combat very quickly devolves into just tanking damage while you wail on enemies with the basic pistol until they drop, 
or once you have access to additional weapons that do take down enemies in basically one or two shots, then you just hit them with that and they'll drop like a sack of potatoes, or in the case of the Orlo, they'll turn into a bunch of giblets. And this process is true regardless of which enemies you're fighting. The tech lords, for example, don't have any more health or damage resistance or anything like that than the standard tech goons. So more often than not, you can just run into the room that they're in, blast them once with whatever your powerful weapon is, and then it's immediately on to the next thing. Really, the only thing that makes the combat even slightly challenging is the fact that on the original DOS version, the controls are just awful. On the Build GDX source port, you can use standard keyboard and mouse controls like you do with pretty much any other first-person shooter, and it works perfectly fine. But mouse aiming didn't really work the way you would hope it would in the original DOS version. It was really quick for horizontal movement, but you actually had to still use page up and page down to aim up and down. Which is, of course, how you would do it if you were using entirely keyboard controls, but when you're also trying to use a mouse, that gets pretty messy. And when you bring it all together, you end up with a really awful first-person shooter. It's definitely not the worst game I've ever played. It's not even the worst game Campstone's ever made. But as far as first-person shooters from the early to mid-90s go, it's definitely up there in terms of the crappitude. But despite it being an absolutely awful first-person shooter, you can still see glimpses of the kind of game this could have been if Capstone had more resources and were just better at game development in general, and of course didn't have the hardware and software limitations of the time and the build engine that they were working with. I mean, you can tell they wanted to make this a proper open-world game where you wander around a realistic city setting and take down the tech lords in whatever order you want, all the while jumping in and out of the matrix in order to use the keys you get from the tech lords in order to make it further in there and combat their nefarious plans. And it even seems like they tried to throw in some sort of either morality or at the very least performance assessment system where maybe you get a different ending depending on how well you do all of these things and how few civilians get caught in the crossfire. Instead, when you're not in the Matrix, you get a really craptastic first-person shooter that just completely falls apart within the first few seconds of you experiencing it. But then, there's the Matrix. The Matrix is this game's representation of a virtual cyberspace. This was kind of big in sci-fi fiction of the late 80s on into the 90s, where the idea would be that in the future you would put on some sort of virtual reality set, and then you would be able to surf around in cyberspace interacting with things directly. Obviously, it's a pretty cheesy, ridiculous idea, but it wasn't exactly uncommon in sci-fi fiction of the time, and so it being included in Tech War is perfectly fine. The problem is how they implemented it. And this is where I need to throw up that second photosensitivity warning. Because the term I would use to describe how much flickering, flashing light stuff is occurring in the Matrix is sensory overload. It is so egregious on that front that even if you don't have photosensitivity problems, you are still very likely to get a severe headache from it at best, potentially even some nausea. So if you are at all concerned about the effect this might have on you, Skip ahead to the time code that I'm showing on the screen right now, because to be perfectly honest with you, the Matrix level in Tech War is one of the worst things that I've ever seen a video game developer inflict upon their players. And that goes for the sensory overload as well as the gameplay, so consider yourself duly warned at this point. I'm going to go ahead and start talking about it further. So like I said, the idea with the Matrix is that you collect a bunch of symbol keys from the Tech Lords when you take them down, and then you can use these symbol keys in order to access different areas of the Matrix in order to help shut down the virus that they've uploaded into it that will supposedly distribute tech across the entire Matrix. Sounds reasonable in theory, except in practice, you are going to be floating around because they decided you needed to float as opposed to walk around or anything like that, because of course cyberspace, using the game's very janky movement controls, which are admittedly considerably better on the build GDX version than they were in the original DOS version, where trying to do everything with a keyboard was absolutely miserable. But even with the considerable improvement the build GDX version provides, the controls are still kind of janky. And you will be using these controls controls to float around environments that have absolutely no logical form to them whatsoever. 
Where environments in the normal running around shooting enemies levels were sometimes labyrinthine to the point of being really confusing and obnoxious, they've got nothing on the 3D mazes that constitute the environments in The Matrix, all of which seem to be composed of whatever random textures they had left over in whatever texture library they were using to make this game, many of which they decided to make constantly flicker back and forth between pitch black and full bright at a very rapid rapid pace. Because there is effectively no logical structure to any of the environments in the Matrix and you're not entirely sure what you're supposed to be doing there to begin with, you're just going to be floating around constantly going, where the hell am I going, what the hell am I doing, and more importantly, why is my eye twitching? All the while, you are being assailed by enemies that are best described as abstract shapes rather than any kind of logical enemy type, and your only method of defending yourself is to use your power glove to launch red orbs at them. And I'm not entirely sure if it's just due to bad hit registration or not, but it seems like nearly all of them go down in one shot, whereas some of them can take a couple of hits before going down, but it's never actually difficult, and pickups for ammo and health in the Matrix are pretty plentiful anyway, so much like with the regular first-person shooter levels, the Matrix combat is completely a joke, and that means that your entire challenge is going to come from the fact that you're going to have absolutely no idea what the hell you're doing. Your first time through, you're going to have absolutely no idea which things you can float through and not take damage versus which things you can float through and take damage, some of which are completely baffling, like you can float through lightning-style electric fields without taking any damage whatsoever, but then sometimes you'll float through an empty corridor and be constantly taking damage for no discernible reason. As you'll float around, you'll stumble across structures that have seemingly no purpose whatsoever and are just there for set dressing, and you'll go, is this important or not? And you have no way of knowing. You'll find something that looks like a swirl on the wall and think that it's just a normal wall texture, or maybe it's a door, but no, it's a switch, and you have absolutely no idea what the switch does because it gives you no indication that it actually seems to do anything at all other than just starts lighting up and spinning. And navigation is complicated further, not just by the mazes themselves, but also the fact that the map you have for navigating is entirely 2D, as was the style for games of that era, and it does absolutely nothing to help you with the 3D environments. For example, there is a maze of blue cubes, and all you see from the map, if you bring that up, is just a flat surface of blue cubes, and it tells you nothing about height or depth. And as if that weren't bad enough, whereas in the normal running around as a first-person shooter levels, you have some very abrupt area transitions when you go around the levels. In the Matrix level, not only are the area transitions very abrupt, but they come in the form of teleporters that don't have any kind of actual area transition. They'll just send you somewhere else in the Matrix, and then you have to figure out where the hell you are and what you need to do there, too. The entire process of simply trying to navigate the Matrix, let alone figure out what the hell it actually wants you to do, goes beyond simply being frustrating or even downright infuriating. It is pure agony, to the point where I'm not entirely sure this game wasn't designed to be a torture device. Because that's just it. I have played plenty of bad or outright terrible games in my time. I mean, hell, the game I've given the lowest score on my channel thus far is Ride to Hell Retribution. I gave that a 0 out of 5, and it well deserves that score, but at least as bad as that is, and at least as bad as, say, E.T. on Atari 2600 is, those games don't cause you physical pain to play them. The Matrix level in Tech War, on the other hand, is physically painful painful on top of having some of the absolute worst design I have ever seen in a video game. And you know what the funniest thing about all this is? The thing that I'm sure some people will be pointing out is, oh come on DW, it can't actually be that bad. The one saving grace about Tech War is that it's really short. And by that, I mean it's less than three hours long, at least playing it through Build GDX it was anyway. Obviously, if you're playing in DOSBox or on original hardware and you're not using the mouse controls and things like that, it's probably going to take a bit longer, but in my particular case, the entire game was less than three hours long. And that was without using any cheat codes or guides or walkthroughs or anything like that. And I even got a bit lost in several of the levels just looking for the tech lords, but also especially during the Matrix section. 
And I am sure that that incredibly short length will lead some of you to think, oh, come on, DW, it can't be that bad. Obviously, you're just being hyperbolic for the sake of the video. And I know there is absolutely nothing I can say or do to make those kinds of people believe me, but for the rest of you, I'm not being hyperbolic here. The entire game is a disaster, but at least with most of it, you can make fun of the mess as you go along. When you get to the Matrix, there's no more laughing. Because there's nothing remotely amusing about it. It's just pain. And it takes a game that was already absolutely awful throughout the entire experience leading up to it, and turns it into something that is ultimately irredeemable. So irredeemable that I would go beyond simply saying it's one of the worst video games I've ever played, and would say outright that it is one of the worst video games ever made. But you only truly understand that if you're familiar with the Matrix level, because the rest of the game is just really bad, but at least amusingly bad. Once you get to the Matrix, it fully cements itself among the worst games ever made. And obviously, as a result, I cannot recommend it to anyone. Do not play Tech War. Not even for the memes. It's just not worth it. Thank you all very much for watching, and thank you all for bearing with me while this video has taken a lot longer to get done than I thought it would. I kept getting interrupted during the process of recording, and it's just been an absolute mess. But hopefully we'll get things back on track this coming week, so stay tuned for additional request month videos and more beyond that. Also, a reminder for those of you who might have questions for the Q&A, make sure you get those question submissions in by the end of the month, because, like I said, the cutoff is going to be March 1st, and then I'm going to get to work on actually making the Q&A video, so stay tuned for that as well. Thank you all again for watching. If you like my channel, please consider supporting it on Patreon. If you can't afford to or don't want to, that's perfectly fine, I understand, but the option's there if you're interested, and every bit really helps. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you all in later videos.